All right. So um, it's a great pleasure to have um, uh, Sasha Shapiro here, who formerly from Berkeley, um, uh, and now at Notre Dame, uh, tell us about um, cluster structure of K-theoretic Coulomb branches. So uh, Sasha, thanks for coming. Okay. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, well, it's a, it's a pleasure to, to be here and to, to give this talk. Uh, I'll talk about some joint work with Gus Schrader, where indeed we um, make an attempt at proving uh, this conjecture by David Gayotto that uh, the so-called uh, K-theoretic Coulomb branches introduced by Braverman, Finkelberg, and Nakajima uh, have a structure of cluster varieties. And uh, um, so I'll just try to give some, you know, geometric definition and then some more hands-on way to look at Coulomb branches and then discuss what, how, how one constructs cluster structure and what it is. Okay, so, so let's do some warm-up. Uh, let me just remind you some pieces of Springer theory. So we start with a Lie group G uh, and uh, well, Lie algebra uh, G and the world subgroup. Um, first, we can consider the flag variety just G mod B and uh, we can consider a nil cone inside the, the Lie algebra. Then, um, uh, well, if we consider the cotangent bundle to the flag variety, this happens to be a resolution of the nil cone. And uh, one way to think of this um, cotangent bundle to the flag variety is just this pairs uh, an element from the nil cone and uh, a Borel subalgebra containing that element from the nil cone. So that's how we think of cotangent bundle. And then we can form the so-called Steinberg variety. The Steinberg variety is um, uh, sort of a well, product of these two uh, cotangent bundles over a nil cone. And, or in other words, it's this triples uh, so there will be this triple will have an element x, which is an element in uh, uh, in in the nil cone, and it will have two Borel subalgebras B and B prime containing that element, right? So it's some sub variety in the product of two cotangent bundles, two flag varieties. Uh, now, the Steinberg variety clearly has a diagonal action of G cross C star, where G just acts diagonally on on the on the flag variety and therefore on cotangent bundle and C star acts just by dilation along the fibers. And as soon as we have variety in, in a group action, you can consider the so-called equivariant K theory. So just being you know, vector bundles, uh, equivariant with respect to G cross C star. Um, since the Steinberg variety has some convolution, then this convolution happens to, um, uh, happens to provide uh, this K theory with an algebra structure and moreover, if you if you think of if well if you study what this algebra structure is you will figure out that uh, this equivariant k theory of the Steinberg variety happens to be the fine Heck algebra and so this Braverman Finkelberg and Kajima Coulomb branch story it's uh, some attempt at uh, well or not attempt but successful attempt of uh, studying this affine version of Springer theory right so we'll just try to to replace all this object by something affine and see what what happens. Um, so, um, well, there's some physical words attached to it, which is you take the 4D n equal to supersymmetric gauge theory, you compactify it on a circle, and you take column branch of that. And this is the object that Brother and Tinkerberg and Nakajima give mathematical definition of. So let's let me start over. G is a complex reductive group. N is some complex representation of G. And then we consider uh, two things. One is we, which we denote k, which is just the uh, um, Laurent uh, series in variable z, and we and, and some other thing o, which is Taylor series in variable z, and uh, a fine Grossmanian is just g over k uh, mod g over o. Right? And then um, before we so so the, the analog of the uh, of the Steinberg variety here is played by something that. Uh, Baroman, Finkelberg, Nakajima call variety of triples. So they know, denote that RGN, so this is some variety which we build from a group and representation. And here what it is. So this thing consists of, well, despite being called variety of triples, it's, it consists, well, one way to describe it is, is this tuples rather than triples. So two elements, one G is just a class, is an element of a fine Grossmannian. So it's a class of G of K mod G of O. Um, and another S is a, um, uh, is an element of a 
representation, but you know, you, you think of this, you, first you, you take this representation and allow coefficients in, in um, uh, Taylor powers of Z, right? So I, I don't know, just N of Z. You take an element S in there, but then uh, what we require is that uh, this element not only lies in N of Z, but it also lies in the G-shift of, of N of Z, right? So, so suppose you, you just started with N of Z, you, you, you acted by an element G of, of fine Grossmanian, it not, no longer has to lie in N of Taylor series of Z, but maybe may lie in N Laurent series of Z, but we now require it also lies in N Taylor series of Z, right? So this tuples that's, uh, that we call RGN, and similarly to the Steinmark variety, this RGN actually has a convolution and it meets GFO same drug product C star action. And again, C star act via what people call loop rotation or actually scaling of, of, uh, of Z. And GFO just acts as, as GFO act on Grossmanian and representation. Okay, um, good. Now, um, so one of the well, main theorems uh, of their paper is that uh, well, if you consider this algebra, which is a covariant K-theory, uh, G of O cross C star covariant K-theory of RGN, this actually happens to be an associative algebra. And at Q equals one, this is more over a commutative algebra. Uh, well, because technically uh, it doesn't, it, it's not, um, not necessarily as soon as you have a convolution, you'll have an algebra structure, an associative algebra structure. So that happens to be the case here as well as in the Steinberg variety. So at k equal one, this thing is commutative and the k-theoretic Coulomb branch is just defined the spectrum of this algebra at q equal one, right? So it's a commutative case. And one way to think about it as, uh, you know, MGN is some affine variety that you define uh, and uh, well, clearly AGN at q equal one is uh, algebra functions in it and uh, AGN at gener gen general q is just a, a quantization of that algebra function. So in other words, this MGN actually has some, some it's a Poisson break. Okay, so that's good. Uh, we have some algebra. Now the question is how on earth one works with this algebra? How do this, think of it? How to de describe it explicitly? And uh, here's in fact what uh, helps. So there's um, a so-called equivalent localization, which allows to embed uh, the Coulomb branch into uh, something more tractable. Uh, so it's some localization of the Coulomb branch where G is replaced by its maximal torus T and we have no representation at all. So if you have no representation, it just means that the, that your variety of triples are G and it's just a fine Grossmanian. And your Coulomb branch is just a covariant K theory of an affine Grossmanian. And uh, there's some chain of embeddings that at the end of the day allows you to embed the Coulomb branch that you were interested in into a covariant K theory of a fine, of, of T of O covariant, a fine Grossmanian of the torus, right? Some localization of that. And the latter algebra is actually, if, if, if you un unwrap what, what it says, it's actually isomorphic to some algebra of two different operators in, well, let's say some variables, lambda i. And uh, uh, when people say localization, it means that this, this algebra is localized at root hyperplane lambda i minus lambda j. So at the end of the day, uh, uh, yeah, is there a question? No. What does localized mean in here? Yeah, okay. So, so localized means the following. So, so at the end of the day, this embedding takes some, you know, L, this Coulomb branch L algebra that you constructed geometrically, and each element can be written as a Q difference operator in lambda i and shifts in, in, in a variable lambda i and shifts di in lambda i. But these operators might have denominators of the form lambda i minus lambda j. Well, so products, some powers and so on, right? Okay, so <clears throat> then the question is, well, can you actually, so you have some, now you realize your Coulomb branch algebra, some sub-algebra in the algebra of rational Q difference operators. Question is how do you find the generators of, of this sub-algebra that you're interested in? And there is a, an answer to that as well. So first of all, there is a rather large commutative sub-algebra in, uh, in our Coulomb branch, which is, which geometrically again comes as uh, uh, a covariant K theory of a point. But since we want to think, well, at least for, for what I, I want to do, I want to think extremely explicitly about this whole thing. So this covariant K theory of a point would just mean for me that it's sub some subalgebra generated by symmetric functions in lambda J. 
right? So there are those huge subalgebra symmetric functions all lying in our Coulomb ray. And then there are some other elements <clears throat> that people consider that happen to generate in, in several different ways um, a Coulomb branch. So let's, let's again give some geometric description of them first. So if you consider a fine Grossmannian, then a fine Grossmannian admits some stratification. Uh, uh, well, this, as, as it's written in the middle of the slide, GRG is some union over lambda, GRG lambda, where lambda runs over um, so, well, some coweight of G. And each, each GRG lambda is just G of whole orbit through Z to the lambda, through this class of Z to the lambda. Now, um, uh, these orbits have, well, if you take one, one orbit, GRG lambda, and, and you close it, the closure of this orbit contains smaller orbits. Uh, so it's, it's actually union over all mu, which are smaller than lambda with respect to this, this ordering on coates of Gurdjieff mu. And therefore, if you want to study, if you want to have a smooth orbit, that means that this whole Gurdjieff lambda, the closure of it has to be, has to be, uh, has to coincide with, with itself with Gurdjieff lambda. Therefore, it's a requirement that lambda is minuscule. Or in other words, that there are no mu smaller than this lambda, right? So, um, the, the reason to, to look specifically at those is as follows. So if you take this variety of triples, RGM, right? So remember there was an element of a fine Grossmannian G and some, some, some element of this representation uh, with a stellar series uh, in Z, right? Now, if I just forget the representation completely, I'll, I'll have a projection to a fine Grossmannian. And therefore, if I have a projection to a fine Grossmannian, I can take a closed orbit in a, well, closed, smooth subright of fine Grossmannian and pull say the, the algebra of, of functions on this on this orbit back to back to RGM, back to right of triples, right? So this way I get some some vector bundle on RGN and these things are called minuscule monopole operators. So some other set of elements in the, uh, the in this quantized column branch are this, the, so people don't know them all are lambda. So there's just this pullbacks of, of the, this, you know, uh, of, of, of O uh, on, uh, of O on this Gurdjieff lambda back to RGM, right? Um, yeah. So, so we take, we take uh, once again, we take the spy inverse of, of Gurdjieff lambda, of closure of Gurdjieff lambda, and then take the, well, all of that, and then take the class in K theory. Okay, right, so this is geometric description, but they have, they have a more hands-on, uh, we can actually write them in terms of uh, key difference operators. Okay. So, um, and now uh, I'd like to focus on, so, so that was all, you know, just, uh, kind of general story, and now I would like to focus on what people call uh, quiver gauge theories. So Kuber gauge theory is, is, is a situation when your group and representation that participate in the definition of this variety of triples and in, in the definition of Coulomb branch actually come from some natural data of a quiver. So this quiver will have a, vertex, a set of vertices, gamma naught, and set of arrows, gamma one. And for simplicity, I'll now, can, until the very end of the talk, I'll consider quivers without framing, whatever this framing means, but then we, we will come back to framing. Um, so, I just have this quiver with versus gamma naught and arrows gamma one. Uh, we define the, the group corresponding to this quiver as G being just a product of all nodes of this quiver, G L V I, um, uh, where, uh, well, okay, so, so when, I say, when I say quiver, I mean that, um, uh, yeah, okay, when I say quiver, I not only mean the combinatorial data of a quiver, but also some gamma not graded vector space. So in the other, in other words, you can think of a quiver as you know each node has some c to the n, c to the n i living at, at this node. Now the group in question will be just product overall uh, nodes G, GLVI, and the representation will be uh, for each arrow uh, between two nodes. You have a homomorphism. You consider the space of homomorphism from VI to VJ, and the uh, uh, product overall arrows from I to J. Uh, of this home spaces, uh, that will be the representation, right? And G just acts by well, change of basis on, on, in the corresponding VI. 
Mm -hmm. I, I didn't understand your, uh, your, your, your definition of the minuscule monopole operator. So I would have thought that the, 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 mono, the monopole operators are basically functions on the Coulomb branch. And, and well, they're elements of the algebra, right? They're elements right. of, yeah. yeah. And uh, now the slices in a function Right, so, so Many are, are spaces. <laughs> so how do I go between the two? Well, no, no, you, you just take, uh, I would say, um, you take the um, image of this closed orbit and then you take all of, well, you, you get some sub right in RG and you take all of that and you take this, this class. And this class is actually a, a class in K theory. Okay, I'll, I'll have to think about it. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. Okay, so in the quiver case, the group, uh, both the group and the representation come from, from quiver in this way. And, uh, um, well, let's say, uh, okay, so, so now let's, let's figure out what are, what are even the minuscule co-weights in this, in this case. Well, let's say that the dimension of each vector space VI at each node is, is DI. <clears throat> and then, uh, well, let's call this pi I N, the nth fundamental co-weight of the corresponding GLVI. And then pi I star N will be uh, sort of, so if, if, if this fundamental co-weight is of the form, or well, maybe I can actually write it here, uh, is of the form, um, uh, so you have some ones and then some zeros. So you have exactly N of those and uh, D I minus N of those, then this, this guy here will be, first you have some zeros and then you have some minus ones. So both are, uh, minuscule co-weights and then a general minuscule G co-weight, uh, well, it's just uh, sort of, it well, has to have some co-weight with respect to each GL, GLVI, right? And at each GLVI, it's one of one of the two. It's all either pi i or pi, pi star i. Um, okay, good. Um, now, um, let me also give some names to this um, minuscule monopole operators, which will correspond to weights pi i n and pi i star n, just, just those, uh, you know, uh, corresponding to just one, one GLD, one node of our diagram. And here's a theorem proved by Alex Wicks in uh, 2019. So originally this theorem is, was proven for uh, cohomological Coulomb branches rather than k-theoretic Coulomb branches. Uh, so in other words, you replace K theory, covariant K theory by a covariant Borel Moore homology, but what he proved works literally for K theoretic case. Uh, so there's no need to, to even change anything. Um, so the Coulomb branch, uh, which I now denote a gamma Q, gamma for the quiver and G and then for this group and representation constructed from the quiver. So this context Coulomb branch uh, is generated by all so-called dressed we'll discuss it in a second, minuscule monopole operators over K theory of a point. Uh, so by all we mean, you not just take EIN and FIN, but you take general minuscule, minuscule co-weight, you take the corresponding monopole operator and you, you, you take all of them and over K theory of a point, so over the symmetric functions of, of um, uh, in, in this groups of variables, lambda I, you know, lambda one, lambda two, blah, blah, uh, this monocle operator uh, minus monopole operators generate the whole Coulomb branch. Now, um, if you wish to allow um, a, a not uh, just uh, um, uh, Laurent polynomials in Q, uh, polynomials in Q, Q inverse, but if you wish to allow uh, rational functions in Q and work over that, then it's actually enough to take uh, monopole operators EI1 and FI1. So the first monopole operators at each node to generate the, the Coulomb branch. Now, this situation is very similar to the following case. So if you think of, and just an example of what's going on. So if you think of um, uh, the quantum group, say, let's, let's think of maybe UQSL3. Uh, sorry, is it visible when I write it? Yeah, so if you think of UQSL3, uh, well, you have um, uh, simple, simple root generators. So you have things like E1, E2, F1, and F2. Two, well, and, and, and obviously cartons. So these things with together with cartons generate UQSL3. 
although um, uh, well the relations if you think of, of relations between them you'd see that uh, commutator of e1 and f1 is uh, people usually write it you know, k1 minus k1 inverse over q minus q inverse and as you take q goes to zero limit so you take quasi classic limit here you don't recover a commutative algebra so instead you recover you, the the inversal enveloping of sl3 now if you want to actually think of quantum group as quantization of some poisson variety what people do usually is they um uh rescale generators so you can also rescale uh, each, you know, EI becomes uh, Q minus Q inverse uh, EI. And same for FI, and therefore uh, that the denominator over here, if you scale both uh, E and F, that becomes a numerator. So at the end, as Q goes to, in the Q goes to one limit, you get commutative algebra. But now E1, E2, F1, and F2, they don't generate the whole, um, the whole Coulomb branch. So you to generate the uh, sorry they don't generate the whole UQ, UQG UQSL SL3 in this case to generate the whole UQSL3 you'd need also um, non-simple roots so you need no not just E1 and E2 but also E12 but to get E12 from E1 and E2 you now need not just a commutator but commutator divided by Q minus Q inverse so you'll have to allow dividing by Q minus Q inverse some some rational functions in Q right so that's an, in in exactly the same way uh, it's not enough to to take just EU, EU, E, e, e i1 uh, f i1 to generate the whole coulomb branch over c of q q inverse but is enough to, to generate over c of q um, okay and now when people say dressed uh, dressed means that uh, these bundles uh, or far lambda are just twisted by some wage power of a tautological bundle so, so remember that our lambda come from um, from some orbits in the fine Grossmannian, so they actually come as uh, well. There, there are some some ac actual fine dimension Grossmannian looking in, and you can take this, this some some the tautological bundle and, and twist by some wedge powers of that twist to those ones. So again, this dress I'll explain in a second uh, what that means in terms of just purely Q difference operators. Okay, so that was. Uh, you know, kind of all about geometric constructions. And now I'll just, uh, I'll just, you know, show some formulas and, and try to explain how to think of these formulas. So as soon as you've uh, considered this equivariant localization and you embedded your, your algebra into um, your Coulomb branch into this algebra of key difference operators, here's, for example, what EIN becomes. So how, how, how to read this? So, uh, uh, di is the dimension of the vector space at node i, at this node at which we consider our monopole operator EIN. Uh, well, at, at which no, the node at which you know the, the weight for EIN comes from. Uh, so we we now we sum over all n element subsets of the set one d one to di, and then we have a product of two things. So first factor is a product over all arrows from vector from node i to somewhere right all arrows that have i as a source well some some function of lambdas um, and the second factor is actually shift operator in group of variables lambda i um, divided by some again rational functions in in lambdas at this node i right so so let's first look at this um, at this guy over here right so the right hand, the, the, the right factor of it is just the shift of, is product of shift operators. And the left hand side, some rational function that only depends on variables lambda at node i, right? Now the prefactor, this, this product here, or you know, product of all arrows from i to somewhere, uh, it's again, it's a rational function in, in two sets of variables, lambda i, where i is the, the source of, the, of our arrow, and lambda j, which is the target of our error. So that's roughly the structure of this, these operators. Now, uh, important thing about it is really that if i is a sink, so there are no arrows out, outgoing from i, then this, this first factor completely disappears. And what we get is just this, this formula sum over all n element subsets of this curly di ij. Right? <clears throat> 
And same actually works for FIN, but uh, FIN becomes the simplest if I is the source rather, if I is the source rather than the sink. Right? So at least while well, we see some, some hands-on formulas, so we'll, we'll see what, what to do with them. Um, okay, so that was a slide about structure of this monopole operators. Sorry, what's D? Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, this one here? I'm mm -hmm. oh, sorry, this is the shift operator in Lambda IR. So maybe let me just, just write it. Uh, yes, good question. D I R lambda uh, J S is equal to Q to the power delta I J delta R S lambda J S D I R. <clears throat> okay. Okay, good. So we see it's like some few different operators and as we promised, they have these denominators of the form lambda i r minus lambda i s. Right? That's exactly what we, what we said, they, they, exactly the type of denominators we allowed. Right, let's do some example. Um, so uh, uh, we'll have a, well, one of the kind of simple quivers, uh, we'll have one node and one loop and uh, at this node we'll have C to the D, the, the vector space. <clears throat> so the algebra of key difference operators we embed into non-localized yet is just algebra. So we have one node, so we have just one group of variables, lambda i and di. i runs from one to dimension d. Uh, and uh, well, as I just, just said, the commutation relation between them is di lambda j is q to the delta j lambda j di. So d is just a shift, uh, shift of lambda. Now, <clears throat> sorry, k theory of a point, um, T equivariant, torus equivariant, k theory of a point. This is just functions in lambdas. G equivariant, k theory of a point is symmetric functions in lambdas. And the monopole operators uh, that, that we uh, end up having are this uh, sum of, of, of n elements, sum over n element subsets of uh, this, uh, well, you have this fraction T lambda r minus lambda s over lambda r minus lambda s. R runs over indices in the set J, S runs over indices not in the set J, and then we shift by DR. Right? So, and, and here, if, uh, you, you could recognize this formula as a formula for McDonald's operators. Of course, you could ask where, where T comes from. So T comes from this additional covariance because we have a loop and I, I don't really want to focus on that. So, so T just comes because we have loops. So, if our quiver have loops or longer cycles, the, there will be some additional um, equivalent parameters or um, just in terms of somehow, uh, in terms of purely algebraically, in terms of Coulomb, quantized Coulomb branches, uh, there will just each, each cycle in your quiver just adds the additional um, central element of, of your algebra, right? Here, the central element is T. And so <clears throat> uh, here we see that, that this Coulomb branch corresponding to this uh, quiver is actually just the spherical dach of GLM because spherical dach is indeed is just generated uh, over the ring of symmetric functions by these McDonald's operators that are written out in the slide. Okay. <clears throat> so that's type of algebra we would like to, to understand better. And um, uh, here's one conjecture uh, about these, these algebras. So it's conjectured by David Gaiotto. So he said that K-theoretic Coulomb branches are cluster varieties or, well, if you quantize, quantized K-theoretic algebras are quantum cluster varieties. Um, now, where, uh, so, okay, I'm, I don't know anything about, about physics involved, unfortunately, but, but, you know, just the level of some, some words that I've learned. Um, so where, does this cluster structure, where is this cluster structure supposed to come from? So um, cluster structure always comes with some, some quivers of its own that are completely unrelated to this gauge quivers we were discussing, right? So, um, so where we should take these quivers from? Well, the idea is as follows. So in, in physics, this Coulomb branch is some, you know, some, some branch of a model of vacua in some, in some theory compactified on a circle. And this theory has something that, that people call BPS quiver. And this BPS quiver is supposed to be exactly this quiver of the cluster variety. That's the, just as a motivation. 
And I'll, I'll actually explain later in the talk how, how exactly we construct this, this cluster queries. So um, some theorem that parts of which are proven, parts of which are still in progress uh, is as follows. It's theorem by, by Gus and myself, uh, Gus Schrader and myself. Um, sorry, and this whole thing is, is obviously the joint work with Gus Schrader. So for each quiver, for each gauge quiver gamma, uh, or the quiver of, of, uh, of a gauge theory, uh, there is another quiver, Q gamma, and the corresponding quantum cluster variety, uh, which I denote L Q, L Q gamma, uppercase Q for quantum, and an embedding of this Coulomb branch into this cluster variety. So in other words, we don't quite prove Gaidos conjecture. We don't, we don't show an, an, an isomorphism of these two algebras, but we at least we embed the Coulomb branch into the corresponding quantum cluster variety. And uh, this embedding has some nice properties. In particular, um, if you choose a node which does not have um, uh, uh, loops adjacent to this node, then the, the operators, e, if you choose this node i, then operators i, e, e i n and f i n, this, this monocle operators, they actually become cluster monomials. And e i one and f i one actually become cluster variables. But that's uh, yeah, so, so the rest of the talk is, um, uh, I will try to explain, you know, the construction of this quantum cluster variety and how one embeds this uh, Coulomb branch into quantum cluster variety and then also what one can uh, gather, uh, gather uh, what useful information one can gather from this cluster structure about the Coulomb branch. Sasha, you have a question in the chat, whether, yeah, like, uh -huh. whether, whether these are Poisson structure. Yes, it's a yes, it's a cluster Boson, it's a cluster Boson variety. Yes, yeah, thank you. Yeah, it, I'm sorry. yeah. Okay, and now uh, also well, have questions, Sasha. Uh huh. Um, uh, when you when you write this theorem, is it part of the theorem that Q gamma is the BPS quiver? No, it's not. So the only thing in this theorem, uh, yeah. So in this theorem, the only thing we do, we take a gauge quiver from it, we, 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 we give an algorithm of how to construct some other cluster quiver and how to embed Coulomb branch into quantum cluster algebra. We do not prove that this is actually a BPS quiver. But in, in some known cases, it, I mean, okay. I, I, well, I wouldn't, I, I, I personally don't know how to compute the BPS. If you give me a, 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 a gauge theory, I don't know how to compute this BPS quiver, but you know, in some cases that I know BPS quivers of this quiver is coincide. Okay. All right. So, hey, what, what, do you, what do you mean you don't know how to compute? Isn't it a well-defined procedure from studying the representation spaces? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Let me take it back. Um, we we have not checked that that this is actually the BPS quivers. Although in I some see. cases that we, we well just because we were lazy, but in some case, cases that we know BPS quivers of these things coincide. So what is the meaning of this, of this arrow here, this the double arrow in this slide? Uh, so this is, uh, okay, when I asked, <laughs> when I asked David Gaiotto, like what was the motivation for this conjecture? He said, well, the, you know, this BPS square of the theory should, should know a lot, should, should, should know something like cluster structure of, of that, of that, uh, uh, of the Coulomb branch. So take this double arrow as a motivation as a motivation for, for, for the conjecture. Are you saying that the, the, those could, in principle, be two different quivers? Sorry? You're saying, in principle, those could be different quivers? Yeah. Yes, in principle, yes, but, but the belief is that they're the same. Because it is, it is common when studying these things to actually look at the cluster variety associated with BPS quiver. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah, I mean, okay, I, I'm not ready to claim that, the, the, I'm, okay, I, we haven't proved that these are these things that are the same. The expectation is that they are the same. I, mean, I, I think one could have also said something like um, that one expects um, these k theoretic Coulomb branches to be a uh, self mirror in a two dimensional mirror symmetry sense. So basically, they generalize these examples of, um, uh, say, um, what they call a multiplicative A-N surface. Mm -hmm. This is a way of generating huge families of these examples. Basically, by um, 
you're already studying a four-dimensional gauge theory in a circle. To get to problems in two-dimensional mirror symmetry, you need to compact it in an additional circle. So basically, the self-mirror property comes from saying, well, I can exchange the roles of these two circles, and obviously nothing should change. Um, and uh, and I, I think then the rest of the, the, the structure is some kind of interplay between, I mean, it's just a consequence of what we think we know two-dimensional mirror symmetry does, right? Um. So, so in other words, it would, the, the, the way I, I guess Aru and, and others um, uh, explained, um, um, it, it naturally sort of, ex, ex, if you think about mirror symmetry in some SYZ sense, that naturally the, the, your space is built out of some charts mm -hmm. um, and, 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 and some transition functions and those exactly have cluster structure. So mm -hmm. yeah, okay. I, I guess is the statement of, later proven by Konsevich okay. and others. Okay. Maybe, let me also maybe say this, that uh, if the gauge curve is type A, then um, uh, the screws we construct are definitely just exactly the, the, the BP screws of the theory. Well, that, that can, for example, uh, one can see, I don't know, from uh, like works of Hanani, for, uh, for example. Uh, yeah. <clears throat> okay, so let me now, switch on and, and explain what quantum cluster variety is. And Mina, yeah, sorry. So, uh, sorry, are we talking about the BPS quiver? You just, sorry? You, there's a second quiver, right? The quiver describing the BPS states, right? Is that, that is yeah, okay, so, so there are two quivers in the game. One is just the quiver, the gamma, the quiver of the gauge theory, and another, the quiver that one would construct from it and, and that, there's this other core, A is supposed to be the BP square of the theory, and, and B, well, sorry. The second core one constructs from the gauge core gamma, the quiver of our cluster variety, which is supposed to coincide with the BP square of the theory, and uh, for uh, when gamma is of type A, then they actually coincide, when the gauge quiver is of type A. But, but I would imagine that this is something that like, people like Vivek can prove theorems about, right? <laughs> Vivid. Well, I don't know the first thing about BPS quivers, but I imagine someone could prove theorems about it. No, but you, you have some canonical way of associating quivers, right? To, 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 to basically, like the way quivers arise from mirror symmetry, right? Th those should be the same ones that also physicists consider. All right, go, uh, I'll, I'll think about it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, let Sasha continue. So, Again, just, just to put a uh, stop here. Uh, yeah, the expectation is that the curves we construct are exactly the curves of the theory and uh, the gamma is type A, then uh, they are. <clears throat> so cluster varieties. Um, so what it is on the, just, just classically on the Poisson level. So it's, it's an affine Poisson variety with, in general, some infinite collection of charts with some nice properties. So what are this, what these nice properties are is First, each chart is a, is a torus, C star to the D, with D is fixed, clearly. The Poisson brackets between the store coordinates are log canonical, so which means that bracket of Yi and Yj is some constant times Yi, Yj. Uh, and then the gluing data between these charts is given by some subtraction-free rational expressions, some, so some specific kind, people call them cluster mutations. And, uh, <clears throat> Uh, these cluster mutations come as um, sort of, um, so it, each chart has exactly D many adjacent charts. Um, so I can sort of mutate in direction K and this, this mutation, this gluing to adjacent chart in direction K only affects variable YK and uh, uh, other variables that have non-trivial Poisson brackets with YK and leave I, everything else as is, right? So that's, that's how gluing data roughly looks like. No, I, I have a question. Yeah. This, this BFN space, is it smooth? Um, I, I think in some cases, yes, and not in general. Yeah, I don't know in general. Yeah, but so what do you mean it is, sits inside this cluster variety and you think it's the same? Like what, what, what are you going to mean by cluster variety? 
Do you mean one. union of the charts or some closure of it? Or do you only make statements up to code dimension two? I, all, I only make statements up to code dimension two, and for now I only talk about, about uh, algebra of functions. I'm only okay. going to prove that the, 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 this quantized uh, quite nice column range embeds into the global algebra of functions on the cluster variety. I see. In type A, they're smooth, and more generally, um, not, in, not, not, not. <laughs> mm -hmm. not. Um, yeah, okay. I, uh, so I, I, think I would expect that actually if gamma is a tree, so it doesn't have cycles and, and loops, then it should be smooth, but I, I, I wouldn't bet my head on it. Ever. No, if, uh, I, I think if you, if you, if you take the original quiver of the gauge theory, mm -hmm. you, can, you can put flavor um, only on, on, on nodes associated to minuscule representations and then it's smooth. Oh, I Otherwise, see. I don't think it's... I see, I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. Well, I, I know this for, for the cohomological ones, but uh, I suspect the same is true as KT. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Uh, right. So, so that's what roughly cluster variety is. Now it's, it's convenient to encode cluster charts by uh, well, quivers with uh, where vertices correspond to coordinates y j, and uh, and epsilon is just a adjacency matrix of of this this uh, quiver. So adjacency matrix tell you the Poisson brackets. Uh, now, um, how do you quantize this data? So what's a quantum cluster chart? Uh, so first, let's just fix some lattice uh, z to the d, and uh, and let's fix this q form on this lattice. And then we can define uh, a quantum torus. So uh, it, over uh, Z of QQ inverse, this quantum torus uh, is generated by uh, variables, by generators Y lambda, where lambda uh, is just element of the lattice. And uh, the relations between Y lambda and Y mu is as written in here. So this is just a quantization of the, of the Poisson brackets we've seen before. Right, so it becomes indeed the like, algebra generated by Q commuting generators. Now, <clears throat> if you choose a basis in, in your uh, lattice, that defines your quiver because, well, uh, again, vertices of the quiver become this uh, uh, generators, correspond to generators Y, E, J, where E, J runs through, through the basis. Uh, the, uh, the adjacency matrix, so number of errors from I to J is just this the value of the skew form on, ver on uh, the basis elements EI and DJ, right? Okay, <clears throat> so this type of data, uh, this choice of a basis, uh, the corresponding, uh, yeah, th this, this choice of basis, you, if you have it, you end up with what you can call a quantum cluster chart. So it's uh, this algebra over here, right? So again, generated over Z of QQ inverse by this elements Y, E, E, I, I runs from one to D, and the Q commutation relations as, as, as written in this, in this line. So they exactly quantize the, the classical chart we've, we've been looking at. Now let's discuss what's the ex explicit form of a mutation. So what's a mutation? Mutation in direction K, first what it does, it just, it does a change of basis, right? So we uh, change, so um, <clears throat> if we mutate in direction K, then EK changes to minus EK and the EI changes to uh, e i plus e e k if, if, well, plus some multiple of e k if there were errors from i to k and, and just nothing happens uh, otherwise, right? Just some change of basis. <clears throat> okay. Oh, sorry. Now, to each mutation, one associates a birational isomorphism of um, uh, this chart of, 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 your, of your quantum chart you started from, the birational isomorphism is just a conjugation by uh, what's called the quantum dial algorithm or pu po gamma symbol. So it's uh, is a psi qz over here. So it's a product over all n, uh, one over one plus q to the two n plus one z, right? So uh, one other way to think of this quantum dialogue is as a q version of a gamma function, because indeed, if you just take Psi Q of Q square Z, it's one plus QZ times Psi Q of Z, right? So it's some, some, some multiplicative or Q analog of, of a gamma function. Um, and the quantum cluster mutation is exactly the change of basis followed by this birational automorphism. Right? So let's see how it works on, in, in an example. Um, 
So suppose you just have quiver uh, consisting of two nodes and the one arrow, uh, you know, from the first node to the second. This means that your quantum cluster chart is just uh, algebra generated by two generators y1 and y2 with commutation relations y2 y1 equals q square y1 y2. Uh, the so if you mutate at the second node y2, this just becomes y2 inverse. That's what happens from the from the um, uh, change of basis. Now, if you uh, mutate y1 uh, in, in direction 2, right? So the change of basis does nothing to y1 because you only have an error from 1 to 2, not from 2 to 1. Then you conjugate it by quantum dialog. And because of this, um, so, so let, let me spell, spell this out. So because of commutation relations because of y2 and y1, uh, you can rewrite this, this as, um, well, maybe I should write it here. Um, y1 psi q of q square y2 uh, psi q of uh, y2 inverse and now you use this uh, q gamma q q gamma property and that just becomes y1 times one plus q y2 right so this is uh, indeed a birational transformation of the quantum chart right now the quantum cluster variety uh, which we denote here lq right is the following thing it's a sub algebra of any particular chart consisting of, of those elements which stay uh, Loran under uh, any sequence of cluster mutations. So they don't acquire the, the denominators, they, okay? They stay Loran polynomials in, uh, in variables uh, yj, okay? So in other words, this quantum cluster variety is just a um, uh, quantization of a global algebra function on this cluster Poisson variety that uh, we discussed one slide ago, two slides ago. Okay. So now, one thing that will be necessary for this talk is some some space of representations that naturally uh, that this class varieties naturally have, and <clears throat> here's how one can construct it. So the construction is, is more or less naive. So let's. First of all, let's parameterize uh, this quantization parameter Q as e to the pi i b square, where b is some, well, say it's some uh, positive, uh, well, b square is some positive real number. Uh, I, I'm, so in other words, I'm saying that Q is on the unit circle. I'm asking b to not be, uh, I'm asking Q to not be a root of unity here for simplicity, but if it's a root of unity, still everything actually works, it becomes slightly more complicated. Now, um, if we parameterize Q this way, then there is a homomorphism from any given quantum cluster chart with generators uppercase yj to a Heisenberg algebra with generators lowercase yj hat. So this uh, Heisenberg algebra will have uh, commutation relations as, as written in the slide. So the, the commutator of yj hat and yk hat is just epsilon jk over 2 pi i, where epsilon jk is the same epsilon that was our data of, of a Poisson bracket. And um, one can check that uh, such a map is indeed a homomorphism from a quantum cluster chart to some completion of, of Heisenberg algebra. And now you can take the, the most standard representation of Heisenberg algebra and pull it back to your quantum cluster chart. So, so what, the, what, what would be the most standard one? Well, you have some, uh, some generators with uh, constant brackets. So you can you know, do some monomial change of basis so that uh, your brackets are canonical, ask one of your generators to act by multiplication and another by uh, derivatives, right? So when you pull it back to, uh, to, um, to uppercase yj, to the generation of the quantum cluster chart, you exponentiate, so one, half of them become multiplication by e to the, to the, uh, to the y, and another half becomes shifts in, in that direction. Right? Now, okay, so, so algebraically, what was going on? We we we, um, we had a variety, and then and then we had charts on it. So algebraically, we have an algebra and localizations of this algebra, right? And we just described how to write uh, representations of these uh, localizations. And now we can, of course, well, we, our our algebra is embedded in each of its localizations, so we can pull back everything, pull everything back to our algebra, and technically speaking, we'd get different representations from from different charts. Now, what Falken Goncharov actually proved is that in this regime, when Q is on the inner circle, this pullbacks to um, 
to uh, the, the algebra of interest, to this quantum cluster algebra, are actually unitary equivalent. And this, this, this pullback is called the, the, the positive representation. Now, this positive representation does not depend on a, on a particular chart up to unitary equivalent. Now, well, one technical problem here is that, well, at, uh, if you use on the unit circle, uh, then, uh, oh, by the way, how much time do I have? We tend to be flexible, so, um, or um, rather, often speakers would find a natural stopping point right about now, and then, um, and then we'd, <laughs> we'd continue, but <laughs> basically we're really flexible. <laughs> I'm not even sure what this means. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah, maybe can I have like five more minutes and then stop, and, and yeah, and then, we'll, yeah. Okay, so, right. Uh, Right, so the problem at Q equals one is that, uh, well, the, 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 this um, uh, quantum dial algorithm is just, it's not convergent, right? So we need to replace it with something. Now, if we're, and the way to, to, to go is to replace this quantum dial algorithm by something that people call non-compact quantum dial algorithm. And uh, one way to define it is a unique solution to this pair of different, different equations. Uh, each of these equations is just uh, rewriting of uh, this uh, Q gamma uh, Q gamma relation, uh, this this quantum gamma function relation for B and for B inverse for these two two, two different uh, uh, yeah, uh, regimes. <clears throat> now, um, so there is a replacement for a quantum dial algorithm. Now, each um, operator y k hat, whether it acts by multiplication or by by derivative. Uh, it's a self-adjoint operator, and uh, this this uh, non-compact quantum dial has this property that um, uh, well, it's it's unitary. So, um, in other words, uh, the quantum cluster mutations give rise to unitary uh, to unitary operators on your representation. And uh, and these uh, the the representations coming from different charts were exactly related by this quantum cluster mutation. So now they're related by unitary operators. Okay. So at the end of the day, we get this positive representation of a quantum cluster variety. And now maybe uh, uh, let's see. Yeah. So let me at least you tell some known statement of of the theorem that I promised. So. Um, so back to Coulomb branches. How does one construct this cluster quiver from a gauge quiver? Let's consider that the simplest possible case when the group G is GLM and, and there's no representation. Uh, the representation is trivial. So that means that the right of triples is just a fine Grossmannian and the Coulomb branch is just equivalent K theory of an affine Grossmannian. And um, there are two theorems that, um, uh, well, one by Zrukovnik, Finkelberg, and Mirkovich. Uh, which says that uh, the algebra of interest, so equivalent K theory of an affine Grossmannian, is actually isomorphic to the quantized phase space of some integrable system, the GLM Coxer Toda system, right? Uh, or like open quantum open relativistic Toda. Okay, that's one statement. And another statement is due to Bernstein Zelobinsky, 2003, that this quantized phase space of GLM Coxer Toda integrable system is actually isomorphic to some quantum cluster uh, algebra. Uh, with some quiver that I'm going to show on the next slide and, and, and stop after that and then we can continue uh, if you want. So, um, uh, so here's the quiver and uh, uh, well really the main, the main place to look at here is, is that part. So um, well this, this other nodes are just needed for if you want to, to do GLN rather than SLN. Uh, so the statement is that if you take this corresponding, the, you take this quiver, construct the cluster variety and the quantum cluster variety and then quantize it, get the quantum cluster variety. This quantum cluster variety will coincide by this above two theorems with the current K theory of fine Grossmannian, so with corresponding uh, K theoretic Coulomb branch. And therefore, well, if you have just one, uh, yeah, one node, so if you, the, your gauge quiver gamma is, is just one node and no arrows, then the Q gamma is that guy here. Um, okay, and maybe I should uh, stop here and, and after the break, I'll be happy to explain the, the general algorithm and ideas of proof uh, of, of 
of the theorem. And by the way, yeah, this, this curve that is shown on slide now is exactly the same as, as in this uh, Harold and, and Sabine work. So yeah, that's reassuring. Okay, so let's, I, I think we shouldn't make a break too long because um, Vivek is in Europe and in Europe it's late. Okay. <laughs> so so if, you need a, if you need a couple of minutes, we should stop for a couple of minutes. Otherwise, um, um, well, we'll okay. we can thank you for this part and then <laughs> continue. Okay. okay, I'll be happy to continue. Yeah. Okay, so if you need a few minutes. It's, okay. No, 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 I'm, yeah, I'm good. I, I just figured out I, I, I'm late, so yeah. <laughs> okay, so, right. Okay, so that's, this quiver will be our building block for for the general construction of this q gamma now uh yeah and this q gamma is yeah here it's uh it's c4 uh c uh yeah, four right so um now let's focus on this quantum cluster algebra here for a second so the heisenberg algebra we want to embed everything in uh just have uh uh Coordinates xj and pj, so uh, pj is uh, if you wish one over two pi i d over dxj, right? Um, then uh, this representation that we're talking about in, ter in terms of quantum cluster algebra, what do they look like? Well, uh, as as we discussed so before, so this uh, how do you read them off? So for example, generator it, it, the class quantum cluster algebra will have generators y zero dot 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 to y seven. So for example, y6 in the, our representation will just become e to the two pi b, and then e, and then what's written in blue uh, at, at node six, right? e to the two pi b x2 minus x1. Like y7 will become e to the two pi b p1 plus x1 because that's what's written at, at, at this, at over here, at node seven, right? Okay, so it's rather clear how to read from these quivers the, the representations. Now, uh, indeed, so I put some labels, um, uh, p's and x's and so on. You can indeed check that if I put these labels as, as I put them, then the commutation relations will be exactly given by the adjacency matrix of the quiver. Right? So this is just one way to, to, to write such representation. Of course, I can do monomial transformations preserving the, the arrows. I'll get this unitary column representation. Okay. Now, um, some useful theorem. Um, so uh, this uh, the different parts of this theory about Coxer total integral system can be actually encoded in a very cluster way. So um, there's the thing uh, we call well, we, there, there's this so-called Baxter operator, which uh, uh, is given by this formula over here, right? So it's just product of this quantum dialogue at different uh, different uh, parameters. Now to get this product, what one needs to do is simply mutate consecutively at nodes zero, one, two, dot, dot up to two and minus two. So if you mutate at node zero, let's see, ah, sorry, if you mutate at node zero, uh, you just get uh, P and minus U, but then you get some monomial transformation. So labels change a little. Then mutate at node, node one and you get like uh, P, so N here is four. So then you get uh, at node one, you get P3 plus X3 minus X4 minus U, blah, blah, blah. So uh, if you just keep mutating at zero, one, two, and so on, uh, you get this um, sequence of mutations is conjugation by this backstroke operator, Q and a few. And this Q and a few happens to satisfy two nice properties. First of all, Q and a few commutes with Q and of V at different values of parameters U and V, right? So taking coefficients give you a bunch of um, commuting cooperators. And second, indeed, if you take Q is and- Is that an obvious fact from what you said so far? That they commute. No, why? I mean, there's some p's and x's, and p's and x's do not commute. And then you get some, yeah. Uh, no, it, it, I mean, it, it, this fact really follows immediately from the, the Pantheon relation for quantum dialogues, but it's some, some simple calculation. Right. Now, uh, second thing is that if you take qn of u minus ib over 2, it's some shift in this parameter divided by qn of u plus ib over 2. You get a generator. What I meant is, if you define, if you define these Baxter operators but by the way you did it, does this definition make this fact manifest that they commute? Uh, no, it does not. No, no. You, st you still need to calculate the, the. Yeah, you still need to calculate something. But but it's it's an easy calculation. No, it does not make it manifest. Right. Um, now, the ratio of two Baxter operators with two different two different shifts, same Baxter operator with two different shifts, gives you a generating function for total Hamiltonian. So this is this is just part of this TQ relation. This is actually equivalent to this TQ relation for open total. Uh, good. Okay. 
Now, uh, one other useful piece of data here is that there's something that people call the twist operator or um, one step evolution of, of, of Q system, uh, which is some operator which is obtained by just mutating our uh, quiver at all even nodes. So let me go back to the quiver and show you where even nodes are. So if I just mutate at nodes uh, six, four, and two, at these nodes, uh, not at zero, uh, then uh, mutation of these nodes give me uh, also some operator. We call it tau n. Here's a precise formula for it. This tau n happened to commute with the Baxter operator. Again, it's easy to check. Um, and therefore, um, well, if you want to study, uh, to really understand this uh, coxter the integral system, you should ask, okay, what is the complete set of joint eigenfunctions for these operators that happens to be very instrumental in, in thinking about Coulomb branches, in fact. So let's try to do that. Uh, so just trying to find uh, eigenfunctions for two other Hamiltonians or equivalently for these operators Q and Q and the day twist. Well, again, Maybe this is not even that important how, how explicitly we describe them, but again, they have some very nice cluster uh, description. Uh, so you can define some other operators Rn of you, which is also given by some sequences of mutations. Just you stop one step short. So you try to do the backstroke operator, but you, you stop one mutation short. This is Rn of you, this is our definition. And then you define uh, uh, the Q-Whitaker function by this formula over here. So you take the plane wave, and then you keep applying this operators R2, R3, and so on up to Rn. Um, right, so lambda and x are just vectors uh, of, of lambda, lambda is and x size. Cb is some constant. And uh, so we've constructed some set of functions. And then we can define a uh, something what we call B Whitaker transform. So that's the important part here because what we're going to do, we're going to take function in uh, variables x and send it to some other function, um, which um, is going to be symmetric, whether, uh, but some, some other function in variable lambdas is going to be a symmetric function variable lambdas. And uh, the original f was just L2 function with respect to the usual measure on uh, dx on Rn. And the new fun and the, the target will be some L2 function with respect to some other so called Scanian measure, which again, I don't want to describe here. And, uh, and this is just a Fourier transform with respect to this, this kernel given by a Whitaker function, right? So now it, the target space is actually good for us because that's okay, at least we get some, some, some uh, at least we get some symmetric functions in lambda. So let's see what happens with all the operators we've, we've discussed so far under this transform. Um, so first of all, the int twist just becomes, uh, the int twist just be, becomes diagonal, so it's just, multiplication by that by that function under Whitaker transform. The, um, this QN of U, uh, the, the, the backstroke operator, becomes, again, just multiplication by some product of quantum dialogues. U was a parameter, it's still a parameter. Lambda Js are our new variables lambda, uh, lambda on the right-hand side. Uh, to other Hamiltonians become symmetric functions in variables lambda inverse. Okay, that's also good because we already, we wanted, th this is, this is this, they actually will give us K theory of a point. And uh, this node, uh, one of the nodes of our quiver, uh, this node, uh, let me show some, some node over here, this, um, yeah, the, the last node, uh, the, 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 this node here, actually, actually becomes exactly the operator, exactly one of the monopole operators that we were, that we were looking at, that, 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 we, that we've seen at, in this um, K theory, in the, in the quantized Coulomb branch. Okay, good. So now what it tells us, it tells us that this Whitaker transform takes us from this uh, some positive representation of this quantum cluster variety into some natural representation of the Coulomb branch that we get from localization formula. Uh, okay. Now, how do we do it in general? How do we construct a quiver Q gamma from quiver gamma in general? Okay, <clears throat> so what we've seen so far for one node um, tells us that, okay, well, if we have, if gamma is just, so, so if gamma is just one node and here, uh, sorry, one node, and here it's C to the four, then uh, the Q gamma should be just clear over here uh, in the bottom. Now, if gamma is two nodes, uh, and I, uh, I forget a little which way, which, 
the way we said the direction of error will have to go, I think, like this. So from C4 to C3, this is a concatenation of two quivers of the same kind, right? So we concatenate this quiver with that quiver and put some, you know, put some arrows between them. Now, um, uh, the way we concatenate, so, so how to describe these quivers? As long as you know these blue labels, you know exactly the, the arrow, the quivers and the arrows between them, right? So it's equivalent to just describe these blue labels and, and uh, we just said, so, so really it's important to understand this, uh, this node over here. And as soon as you know that, you know, you know how, how all, the, all the quivers concatenate together. Okay, so each node corresponds to this GL and Cox Rotoda quiver. And if you have an arrow, you just concatenate the two. Um, right. Ah. Now, um, so how do we go from Coulomb branches to this cluster variety? Okay, so <clears throat> localization theorem embeds this Coul Coulomb branch algebra into some algebra of Q difference operators, some rational Q difference operators in variable lambda IG, right? So in other words, we have uh, this Coulomb branch algebra uh, a gamma Q, and you embed it into some Q difference operators in lambda IJ, right? Then here you have, ah, well, so bad. And here we have some other Q difference operators uh, in some variables, well, let's call them X, I guess IJ. Right. So to go for, to go, this vertical arrow is given by by Whitaker transform, and uh, uh, you have a quantum cluster variety gamma. Uh, uh, sorry. Uh, what do we call them? L Q gamma, which is embedded here by its natural uh, positive representation. So, so the bottom bottom arrow is the positive representation. The top arrow is localization, and uh, the vertical arrow is the Whitaker transform. Right. Now, our task is to construct, oh, so the task is to construct this, this arrow here, right? Or in other words, you can just see what, um, if you know that both representations are faithful, which they are, you just need to recognize the images of generators of this Coulomb branch inside the image of this quantum cluster variety in, uh, well, under this critical transform. Okay. So let's let's see again what's uh, what's said here. So localization embeds Coulomb branch into this rational key difference operators in some variable lambda. The Whittaker transform um, uh, takes from rational key difference operators in lambda to actual polynomial key difference operators in in, in X. Uh, we need to construct this vertical map, um, and then we need to show indeed that the 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 minuscule monopole operators are universal around. So they actually lie not just in some localization of the quantum cluster algebra, but actually they lie in the, in the uh, global algebra functions. Because the way we construct this positive representations is we, we pull them back from a specific chart. So we know that uh, everything that lies in the image of this chart will be uh, actually in the localization of our quantum cluster algebra, but not necessarily in the, in the algebra itself. And again, uh, specifically, uh, what uh, like to just build some dictionary, uh, Todd Hamiltonians become symmetric functions in lambdas, or well, in these notations in lambda inverse. Um, uh, some some other specific elements of um, uh, our uh, well specific generators of our um, quantum cluster algebra, this y two n minus one, so some nodes of the quivers become the first monopole operators, EA1. Dressing, if you want to, to you know, twist something by, by some wedge power of a tautological bundle, you just need to apply, it, it corresponds to applying Dane twists on the cluster side. And uh, uh, moreover, uh, one can actually express uh, both the total Hamiltonians and this y two n minus one in terms of A variables, or in other words, some certain elements of the upper cluster algebra um, uh, sorry, some elements of, of this, of this, uh, uh, sorry, some elements of this uh, quantum cluster variety. So global, uh, consideration of global algebra functions on the cluster variety. Uh, okay. So that's the scheme of, of you know, how, how things are proved. Now, um, 
So now that and at this point would be almost done if we knew how to swap orientation of, of the arrows in the quiver gamma, right? Because, well, I mean, we know that the Coulomb branch is generated, well, up to some minor technical issues by this first monopole operator, say, I1 and F1. Uh, and the K theory of a point, we know where K theory of a point goes, we know, and we know, uh, like, if we can make a, a node a source or a sink, we know where the CI1 and FI1 go, right? So if we can arbitrarily, if we can swap the arrows and make sort uh, no source or sinks would be done. <clears throat> and okay, so if you just look at monopole formulas, you'd see that swapping an arrow corresponds to conjugating a monopole operator by this uh, expression over here, right? So indeed, if you take monopole formula conjugate by such a such a product, you'd, you'd exactly uh, get result of swapping an arrow. And um, uh, now we just need to find sequence of mutations that uh, acts on this on the product of two Whitaker functions with exactly that eigenvalue. Right? So if I understand correctly, you sort of solve the theory in one cluster chart, and then now you're asking how do I figure out what the other charts are? Is that correct? Uh, almost. I mean, I. I well, yes, somehow that that's correct, but I, I only know where everything goes in one cluster chart if, if, well, sorry, I know where the monopole operator goes if this monopole operator is at a source or at a sink. And otherwise the formula is complicated, right? And I want to be able to go for between, to swap the orientation of arrows, go between different cluster charts, and then, okay, I say, well, I make this, I swap arrows, I make the particular node a sink, then I know where this operator goes. Right? Swap again, make it source where, I know where this operator goes. Right. right, so, and now I'm just trying, so swapping an arrow in terms of this, uh, this Coulomb, on the, on the, on the uh, somehow, the, on the Coulomb branch side, the lo localization of Coulomb branch side is conjugating by that, that function in this red frame. The question is, what does it correspond to on the on the cluster side? So, what happens when I push it through this inverse Whitaker transform? Right. Um, and uh, uh, well, uh, we actually know an answer to that when one of the dimensions of these two nodes is is one, right? So here, the question is really, we want to swap. We have these two nodes, dimension I don't know n and m, and we want to uh, nodes I say i and j. We want to swap this arrow. Now I'm saying that if one of the dimensions is just one, then we've already seen how to do that. Because what does the job is the Baxter operator, right? So the Baxter operator uh, uh, pushed through the Whitaker transform gives the second value, which is exactly what we, we, what we need, right? So this mu is exactly what the, the first dimension has to be one. Uh, and um, now the question is how to generalize this Baxter operator to, to case of, you know, when, you have, when both dimensions are non one, where it would be bigger than one. Right. So uh, let's just, then it's, it's a little bit of combinatorics. So indeed, I, I claim that some point this backstroke operator is given by consecutive mutations uh, uh, in, in this quiver. And here I just list these mutations and show what happens with the quiver. So you first mutated zero and one and two, three, so on up to six. And uh, you started with the quiver here, you ended with the quiver here. So it's the same type of quiver up to permutation of variables, a permutation of, of vertices, right? This is just some sequence of mutations. With, with sort of double Baxter operator, the replacement for Baxter operator when both dimensions are non one, not one, it's a similar thing. Uh, it's again, just some piece of combinatorics. So for example, here I have, I want to swap these two nodes uh, that have C4 and C2 and an arrow between them. I keep forgetting which direction, say this direction. And I want to reverse the arrow, uh, then the way you do it, you, you build this um, sort of, you draw this rhombus on the right. Uh, and then you kind of read it left to right. And in each column, you first mutate at circled vertices, bottom to top, and then in, in uncircled top to bottom. So I mutate at zero, and then at minus one and one, and then minus two, two, and then zero, and so on. So I do the sequence of mutation and it happens to give me exactly the right, uh, you can push this operator. So the sequence of mutations give me some operator on this corresponding positive representation. I push it through with the transform, see what this operator does and it becomes a diagonal operator with exactly the needed, needed eigenvalue, right? So in other words, uh, by doing the sequence of mutation, I uh, get between these two quivers. This quiver corresponds to C2, say arrow to C4 
and this corresponds to C4 arrow to C2 on the gauge quiver side. Right? So that tells me how to swap the orientation of the arrows. Uh, and then just an overview is, uh, well, okay, so what happened? Given a gauge quiver gamma, together with an orientation of this gauge quiver, we have a recipe on how to construct a corresponding cluster quiver, right? So this cluster quiver just constructs a quiver for one chart. Now, we have an injective homomorphism from the quantized Coulomb branch into some, technically speaking, well, non-commuted field of fractions of the corresponding quantum cluster algebra. Right? Now, um, if we change an orientation of the gauge quiver, this course, we, we, we um, so we have two orientations, so two different orientations of the gauge quiver, we have two different cluster quivers uh, corresponding to these two different orientations, right? But these cluster quivers are related by signals of cluster mutations. Um, now, and if gamma does not have loops, then we know that uh, the, all, all of the generators of uh, quantized column branch, for each generator of the quantized column branch, we can find, uh, you know, a cluster chart in which it is it is easy to show that this generator happens to be a cluster A variable, so lies inside a um, glob, quantized global algebra functions on the cluster variety. Right? So in other words, this way we can show that as long as we don't have loops, but the longer cycles are fine, so as long as we can make everything a source or a sink by swapping arrows, then uh, we have an embedding of a Coulomb branch into the quantum cluster algebra. Now there's some work in progress joined with Philippe de Francesco and Atkadem and, and Gus, of course, uh, where we treat one specific case exactly of this Jordan quiver, so one uh, node and one loop. And there we show that, well, the, uh, there we embed a, um, a spherical DACA, spherical JLN DACA into a quantum cluster variety exactly given by the quiver predicted by, by what, I, what I explained here. Um, and moreover, we actually uh, realize the GLT, the natural GLT's, the GL2Z action on this spherical DACA via cluster mutations. In particular, the, the transformation that exchanges um, to the Hamiltonians, which we know are an upper cluster algebra, with the monopole, with the, the McDonald operators, is, is a part of this GL2Z action. So we know that at the end of the, the day, the the total Hamiltonians are mutation equivalent to the McDonald operators. And therefore the McDonald operator, they, well, their pre-images under Whitaker transform are still in the upper, are still in the quantum cluster algebra, in, in the quantized global algebra of functions on the cluster variety. Right? right, so uh, this, this last case actually, uh, as soon as it's done, we, we have uh, that theorem for all quiver gauge theories, not just for those without loops. And, uh, uh, yeah, maybe just one, if I, if I can have one more minute. Yeah, okay, just one last slide. Uh, so there's something I know very little about. Uh, so this DT invariance. Um, so, okay, each class variety comes with some associated three color BL category given by this, it's quiver Q with some generic potential. Now uh, it's so-called algebraic DT invariance can be collected into a certain generating function, this EQ. And uh, uh, there's a theorem that if there exists a sequence of cluster mutations, which at the end of the day changes all, I call it logarithmic labels, this blue labels that I've, that I've put, uh, put on the, in, in my quivers, to uh, negatives of those, or in other words, just takes all the cluster variables and, and, and um, uh, change them, changes each cluster variable to one over that, right? If, there's, if there is such a, um, such a sequence of cluster mutations, then it's known that the sequence is, applying the sequence is the same as conjugating by that generating function EQ, right? And the sequence is called the DT transformation, right? So as soon as, if, if you're lucky, if you're in this case when such a sequence exists, you know some generating function for DT invariance. Now, um, for quivers, uh, for the quivers Q gamma, constructed from this uh, gauge quivers, if the quivers have no loops, uh, such a sequence indeed exists and it's not really hard to find. So it really consists of changing orientation at every single arrow of gamma and also post composing with some number of the twists at each node. Well, the number of the twists depends on, on, the, on the dimension uh, of the vector space of this node. And well, uh, again, something that I don't know but would like to learn that, well, presumably this, this, this 
uh, function Q should count the BPS states of the theory. Uh, yeah, but that's uh, a question for two audience rather than, than for me. I, I understand that's a belief that it, it should. Uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sasha. This was uh, great. Um, <laughs> Uh, really interesting. Okay, so do we have questions? I have a question. Uh -huh. um, so, in physics, if you if you take a an n equals two theory of class S and you and you compactify on a circle, then the Coulomb branch of that theory uh, is a character mm -hmm. variety, which is known to have the structure of a cluster variety. Mm -hmm. And so, I wonder. Do you see any way to get like a representation theoretic construction of that Coulomb branch as you did uh, in your examples? Uh, that's a fantastic question. Thank you. Yes, in a sense. Um, so, well, let me, first of all, um, well, let, let me just draw something. Uh, uh, one sort of canonical example, well, one natural example that appears in both worlds as a, uh, this Coulomb branch of a theory, a theory of class S and this the BFN Coulomb branch of the quantum group UQG. And uh, okay, in uh, it's actually some, something that I, that, well, okay, this, I, I actually was prepared, so there's some extra slides. So this, cool, this UQG or UQ, UQSLN, well, in this case, UQSL5 corresponds to, uh, like in terms of the, the gauge, uh, the, the, the BFN side. It corresponds to this quiver, gauge quiver C, C2, C3, C4, and the framing node C5. And uh, the, way you, uh, the way you stack these quivers together and get a, a cluster quiver is just drawn over here. So from this head of fibers, you can actually see what happens when you have a, a, a framing node, what to do with the framing node. Uh, now this quiver happens to be actually um, a mutation equivalent to a natural quiver for UQSLN coming from the character variety story where you consider uh, this punctured disk with two mark points on the boundary and say you consider some triangulation and you put this net standard for going through of, uh, you know, five triangulations of each of these triangles and you get a standard quiver and, and uh, well, these two quivers happen to be mutation equivalent. So, and and the same uh, is true for things like um, if you have uh, in general if you have a um, yeah, maybe. in general if you have a um, uh, on the character variety side if you have a cylinder with uh, uh, say either two marked points here or and and zero on the top or uh, uh, Actually, sorry, I, I think yeah, I think if you have up to two mark points on each side, then you can always uh, right, uh, you can always depict it both as some BFN story. And moreover, we would know how to get a quiver for it. And as a character variety story. In general, um, general character variety, any, in fact, any interesting examples, you, they won't, won't uh, they, they don't come into BFN story, but as you know, you can take this character variety and you cut it into a pair of pants. And as you cut it into a pair of pants, so what's a pair, what's pair of pants really? Uh, uh, so it's some picture like this, which you really can think of as sort of picture for what we just said, quantum group, which kind of identified these two sides. And that has a natural um, interpretation, well, a suggested interpretation. So really you should uh, somehow uh, take this, this uh, frozen variables. And also, so I guess this variable you'd have to connect uh, somehow to I don't know, these two uh, uh, vertices and then this variable to, to like these two vertices and this variable to these two vertices and so on. And you can, you can retell the story of um, somehow, as soon as you cut your character variety into pairs of pants, then each of the pair of pants you can um, realize in sort of in a flavor of this BFN story. But, none, but as soon as you have a um, pair of pants, you, you actually, it, 
it's not it's not really an example uh, of of BFN construction, as far as I understand. But it has some very similar flavor, um, cluster-wise. I don't know if it, I, I hope I answered, but I, Yeah, that's great, thank you. I would also add that, um, uh, as far as I understand, the, uh, the quiver that you get from a triangulation of a surface, mm -hmm. that is the BPS quiver in the class S that's uh, right. case. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if that, I don't know if that, uh, resolves any of the uh, questions we were talking about earlier. No, but, but as, as I said, we just, uh, so, so we actually just, I mean, we haven't calculated any BPS quivers from the from first principles. So we know that, in, you know, if gauge quivers is, is of type A, uh, the yes, we get the BPS quivers. So yeah, as you said, as if it's a class S theory, then we do. But in general, we just haven't done this calculation. <clears throat> Okay, do we have more questions? <laughs> I don't, um, I don't have a precise question. <laughs> um, it's a question I always <laughs> have in, in the, almost any talk about integrable models. Is this appearance of integrable models somehow in the family with others or this is? Uh, sorry. No. Uh, oh. Um. <laughs> yeah, okay. Anytime integrability enters the story, everything is related to everything else. The question is to sort of give a, like a picture of how it actually fits. Right? Okay. Well, <laughs> let me give several imprecise, imprecise comments on that. So first of all, uh, well, clearly, uh, the, you know, as soon as you have a column branch, this naturally comes with an integrable system just because, well, uh, well it basically was given to you by this equivalent localization, right? Because, well, I mean, at the end of the day, you just, Say that you know the uh, how to say the well you get this huge commutative subalgebra roughly half dimensional which is just k theory of a point which is everything that acts well yeah, right so uh, in the ca in case when we just have one node no arrows at all this commutative subalgebra this is exactly under inverse Whitaker transform this is exactly the total Hamiltonians. So that's clearly, well, you just take total Hamiltonians, you diagonalize them, you get this Coulomb branch story, right? Now, uh, then, uh -huh. Okay, so supposing we study, say, A and quivers. Yes. I'll, I'll pick an N and we study A and quiver. Which, which integrable models am I getting? That's a good question. So I, I don't know how to sort of classify all of them. Uh, so every Coulomb branch gives you some integral model. I, so, well, for example, I'd expect you have things like, I don't know, uh, I say like XXZ, you, sh you should get this way. I think you should, uh, well, definitely, you know, there's this old paper of Kohler that um, um, uh, double Bruja cells uh, give you a degenerate integ integrable system. In fact, they actually give you a completely integrable system and those you will get this way. Um, uh, in, you will get a, uh, so I'll, I'm just giving a bunch of examples. A gelfand Zetlin integrable system for UQSLM you get, you get this way. And this is actually, the gelfand Zetlin system is actually indeed what these, uh, the last slides were about because, well, maybe I'll just show it on this, on this, on this picture. So, so here you can sort of see how UQSL4 is embedded into UQSL, well, how smaller UQSL, SLK is embedded into UQSLM, right? Just as, um, well, uh, kind of, if you just take the, yeah, maybe, let me, yeah, if you sort of just kind of chop it uh, over here and replace this Toda piece by rather a similar hat, which is exactly like diagonalizing the corresponding Toda Hamiltonians procedure that embeds UPSL4 into you, the, the, here UPSL5, right? So on, on this level, you see embedded UQSLNs inside each other, but then what would be the generators of a gelfand Saitlin subalgebra? These are, are exactly the total Hamiltonians at each of these gauge nodes, right? So total Hamiltonians of each of, the, of these things. Um, right, so that's another example of a, um, 
of an integral system that that appears this way. But complete classification, I yeah, I don't know. Um, and and in a sense, in a sense, it somehow rather tells you that this story about different integral system is not as interesting as we might have thought in a sense because basically this huge class of them that we know can be just assembled from total systems. Now, for example, if it's true that, you know, the gap that, uh, well, here we know the gap and Satan. No, is, that's actually what makes it interesting, right? What, because what, what the story of integrability is, is missing and well, one sort of seeks for is some organizing principles, right? Well, Something yeah, to fit it into one head so we don't keep talking about, yeah. you know, this <laughs> exotic zoo of rare animals. <laughs> yeah, but, but just maybe just one, one other sort of trivial remark is that, well, as soon as we know the complete set of eigenfunctions for the system, so for this, uh, quantum open relativistic Toda, uh, the Whitaker functions were known, some formals for them. It wasn't known that they were totally not complete. Now we know that they were totally not complete. And now really it just tells you that we know the, the eigenfunctions for any of, of integral of the system of this class. There's no question whether, you know, these eigenfunctions for XXZ are totally not complete as soon as you can realize XXZ, XXZ this way. It just follows for free. Same for Gelf and Saitlin and so on. Do we have more questions? Uh, maybe, can I ask, uh, in your abstract, you mentioned something about generalized Fenchel Nielsen coordinates, and I guess oh, you didn't mention here. Oh, Could yeah, I they were? Uh, yeah, so it's basically this thing that I was trying to draw here. So you know how, well, Fenchel Nielsen coordinates are some core, well, basically, you know, what coordinates that allow you to cut character variety into pairs of pants, right? Uh -huh. And usually, functional coordinates is like if you have, if you're an SL2 theory, they tell you this uh, sort of uh, well kind of length of this of this cycle here, right? So, well, hyperbole mm -hmm. geometry, you know, like length of that thing, and this this angle by which you rotate, right? So it's it's a pair of canonical canonical coordinates, one of which is this uh, length of this neck. Um, in higher rank, so yeah, and the length of this neck is exactly so if you um, yeah. Let, uh, like if you are in uh, the case, say, of this cylinder that I was mentioning uh, with maybe one more point on each side, uh, uh, with this red cycle, you can associate, so, so first of all, as a character variety, this corresponds to um, uh, GL, oh, sorry, yeah, to G mod at H and to this red cycle, Red cycle gives rise to some permutative subalgebra. Oh, sorry, and let me plug in my laptop before it dies. Uh, okay, good. Uh, right, so, and do this red cycle, you associate some, uh, well, some permutative subalgebra uh, on the algebra, in the algebra function. So here, like, these are add uh, G invariant functions, right? And, Actually, uh, this is exactly where, in what I was saying, Todd Hamiltonians lead. So Todd, Todd Hamiltonians are quantizations of the set G invariant functions. Now, uh, the question is, how do you complete this story to, uh, like, in higher rank? Uh, so in SL2, fine, they give you exactly half dimension uh, up to Casimir, so you're good. Now, in higher rank, uh, you'd have, um, uh, if you just look at this quiver, so this is a quiver which is, um, uh, mutation equivalent to a quiver that comes from uh, the cluster structure of this uh, of this uh, uh, puncture disk with two more points on the boundary, and this puncture and and so you can take so this two other Hamiltonians that you see from this bottom quiver actually are some functions, some well-defined functions uh, on uh, that character variety. So this. Um, so somehow these diagonalized to the Hamiltonians, which live over here, right? They, uh, they correspond to uh, somehow, well, the Casimir uh, that uh, corresponds to this cycle around the puncture of our disk. And the other to the Hamiltonians give you just some functions, some functions, a com complete set of, well, maximum set of commuting functions, uh, on that character variety. And now it only remains to, to notice that the pair of pants uh, is just uh, the same as this guy. What, what I said before is the same as this guy, uh, but with identified these two sides, right? 
So what we could do, we can take, you know, uh, our total Hamiltonians from, from, from this picture over here, all of them, not just, not just the last one, but all of them. See what they mean in terms of this, this, uh, this picture over here. Well, the diagonalized ones will correspond to, well, this length of the cycle over here. And the others will actually give you some other functions on this pair of pens. And well, that's, that's a, that could be one shot at what, what uh, the generalized functional concordance should be, right? In particular, it might give you, so it's uh, the, the task really, well, at least what I, what I hope to do is to look at uh, this function, see if they actually give you some nice, in any way, nice uh, basis in the, in the, well, multiplicity space of, of different UQG or of tensor product to UQG representations, because that's multiplicity space exactly what described them by this uh, quantized character variety on this pair of plans. Yeah, so I don't know, again, I don't know how, how good of an answer it is, but, but that's, that's more or less what, what I got. <laughs> okay, yeah, I, I mean, I guess I'm just wondering, so the, the dimension count, so you, you have, do you have an equal number of, of do, you, oh. do you split them into like a length and a twist coordinate? Uh, no, 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 not the twist. So, so up to up to Casimir's, I give exactly. I have exactly half dimension of this um, length coordinates. Oh, of well, of well, I have half dimension of the sort of Hamiltonians, and I'd I'd suggest them as some generalized length coordinates in high rank, and twist coordinates. I don't know. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have more questions? Okay, if not, we should uh, thank Sasha. <laughs> um, this is a wonderful story combining so, so uh, lots of really great ingredients and I, I, I'm sure this is not the end of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so Sasha, thanks for thanks for telling us, and um, yeah, I, I look forward to understanding this. <laughs> all right, okay, Bye. thanks you all for joining us. Okay, take care. Bye. Thanks. <laughs> bye bye. Oh yeah, we can clap. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> okay. Bye. Bye. Ah, oh, good. <laughs> I have figured it out too. <laughs> All right. Take care. Thanks, Thank Sasha. Okay.